Let's move on and for the equine injury database update and a call for more data, we have Dr. Tim Parkin, who's a professor of veterinary epidemiology at the University of Glasgow. Dr. Parkin is head of the Division of Equine Clinical Sciences and professor of veterinary epidemiology at the School of Veterinary Medicine, College of Medical, Veterinary and Life Sciences, University of Glasgow. After earning preliminary degrees, Dr. Parkin, um, Dr. Parkin completed his Doctor of Philosophy on the epidemiology of fractures in racehorses in 2002. Since then, he has worked on numerous projects with several different racing jurisdictions all around the world. Dr. Parkin has twice been an epidemiological consultant for racing Victoria Jump's Race Review Committee and is a member of the Equine Injury Database Scientific Advisory Committee of the United States. Dr. Parkin currently serves on the Veterinary Advisory Committee of World Horse Welfare, the Scientific Advisory Committee of the Pet Plan Charitable Trust, and the Editorial Consultant Board of the Equine Veterinary Journal. He is also an Associate Editor for the Journal of Small Animal Practice. Please welcome Dr. Tim Parkin. Thank you um, for the kind introduction, um, and thank you for the organizers to, for inviting me uh, again to come and give an update on uh, where we're at with EID and what we think the next, next important uh, steps are. Um, I'm going to run through a number of different things today. I'm going to give you the latest update on uh, the figures relating to uh, fatal injuries on North American racetracks. Um, give you a summary of some of the more uh, relevant horse level risk factors that we want to talk about uh, today. Um, talk you through how we test the usefulness of our models, how we test the predictive ability of our models, which is kind of what is really important in the end. We can run lots of different risk factor models, but actually unless it makes a difference to the horse on the ground in the end, then there's relatively little point. Um, and then I'm going to talk uh, on some recent analysis that we've done looking at um, the importance of non-fatal injuries, uh, either recorded in the EID or not, or in training, and, uh, and the impact that they can have on the individual uh, horse uh, taking part in uh, North American racing. And then really just focus and really set a bit of a challenge and ask some questions about how we could possibly um, improve the reporting of non-fatal injuries. It's obviously, um, we've started at the easy end, you know, it's a lot easier to tell that a horse is dead or not. It's quite easy to identify that as a definitive case. But actually determining that a horse has a consistently reported non-fatal injury is much more difficult. And I think that's where the next challenge really sits for us in, in this particular endeavor. So just to remind you, um, it's important to remember that when we talk about annual fatality rates in this part of the world, then we, our definition that we used is a little bit broader than other racing jurisdictions around the world. Uh, the definition of uh, racetrack fatality is a... Uh, a fatality within 72 hours of, the ra of a racing incident. We now produce uh, estimates by calendar year in the spring of each year. Those estimates are point estimates, so we estimate um, exactly what the uh, risk of fatal injury is on different racetracks, on different surfaces, and by age and by distance. But they all have confidence intervals around them, which presents, which gives us some idea of how certain we can be that there genuinely is a fluctuation from year to year to year. So to give you the uh, good news, the, the picture's looking something like this from 2009. This is across all uh, different surfaces. And we've seen a, an approximately a 20% drop in the uh, rate of fatal injury on North American racetracks uh, since that time. And if the same number of starts had taken place in 2017 had had it, as had in 2009, then what we'd have actually seen is uh, approximately 154 fewer horses dying on the North American racetracks in 2017 compared to 2009. And I think that's to be applauded. That uh, demonstrates significant improvement in the situation in this country. And there's many people in the audience who've uh, contributed to that uh, reduction in risk of fatal injury. If you look at uh, across the different surfaces, so dirt, turf, and synthetic, we see a similar pattern as you might imagine. And Obviously, that on dirt, which is the predominant surface in this country, obviously uh, very much mirrors what we see uh, across the piece. But if you look at what we've seen in turf and synthetic, we've seen uh, slightly greater degrees of improvement in turf. Um, turf, 
being fewer starts, then we see slightly more uh, greater variation and, and a, a greater degree of uncertainty around those point estimates. And on synthetic, we see a similar degree of uncertainty. But what we see, interestingly, there was that uh, there was an initial uh, quite good improvement, and then it ticked up a bit, and then it's been relatively level, really, since uh, the sort of 2011, 2012. So to summarize that little section, um, there's clear improvement in the risk of fatal injury for horses on all different tracks since 2009. Clearly, some things are working well. But if you benchmark yourselves against other racing jurisdictions, even taking into account the fact that the, uh, the definition of fatal injury is slightly wider, including 72 hours from race, race, racing uh, events, then there's still significant room for improvement. Now, you're still significantly higher than many of the uh, uh, other racing jurisdictions around the world. What we definitely don't want to see is to see those rates plateau. We don't want to see the slight uptick we've seen from this year continue. We don't want to see it level off. We want to see continued improvement. So the question really is, you know, what more can be done? Um, and before we move on to that, I want to just sort of take you back and, and relay what we've actually, uh, as a group and with the Jockey Club, have actually already been doing so far. So we've got several national and track uh, state or state-specific models. Um, we've developed track or state-specific models, which we could definitely do more of, based on the uh, statistical power we have. We have to have a certain a number of fatalities in each of those different jurisdictions, the state or the individual track, to make it uh, statistically viable to run those models. I think it's really important that we do that, because there are clearly such a diverse range of racing jurisdictions in, this, in North America that actually there are bound to be very many different race, uh, risk factors at different tracks that are going to be very specific to those individual locations that will make a big difference to what goes on at those different uh, tracks. We've also produced models for uh, other than uh, fatality overall, um, fatal and non-fatal injuries for fracture of any type, and then more specifically for proximal sesamoid bone fracture and for uh, cannon bone fracture. And the reason for doing those is that what we do, we tend to start with a very broad definition, but there are bound to be, again, unique risk factors for those individual types of uh, fatality or those individual types of injury that are be, most likely to be pertinent to those particular situations. And if the individual track has a particular problem with proximal sesamoid bones on a particular surface, then they can focus in on that and understand what the risk factors, the modifiable risk factors might be to address that particular scenario. Importantly also, just in the last couple of years, uh, we've, ha we've had access to a greater degree and greater certainty relating to training schedules. So it's now in a lot of the ex exercise information we, re we include in the models, it doesn't just relate to the number of days between races or the number of races in a certain period. Now we're able in many uh, situations to include uh, the number of workouts or training starts that actually uh, those horses are taking part in. And clearly that's really important. We know that training and exercise and physiology of the bone uh, and the stresses and strains that they're put under are really important in terms of uh, determining risk for fractures. So the better we get at actually identifying the true exercise uh, regimens in, under which those horses are uh, uh, put uh, will undoubtedly improve the predictive ability of our models. So just to give you a size of uh, an S, uh, sort of... Uh, uh, an impression of the scale of what we're doing, then we are now dealing with more than 3.1 million starts. This is way exceeds what you might be able to do in a normal Excel spreadsheet and looking at it on a local basis. And it includes more than 150,000 horses included in those. And we cover about 96% of all starts in North America between 2009 and 2017. So there's a lot of data there. We're certainly not lacking data and we're certainly not lacking statistical power. So I'm going to talk very briefly about some of the more common horse-level risk factors, particularly those that pertain to non-fatal um, injuries. So I'm going to talk a, bit, a little bit about previous EID-reported injuries, um, appearance on the vet list, and time with the same trainer. So firstly, uh, it is important to remember that these are only EID-reported injuries. Uh, some of them will be non-reported, so some injuries will go as unreported, and you'll see some plots at the end that demonstrate that. But equally, there are very many injuries in training that obviously we don't have any real idea about as well. So there's a lot of re a reasonable amount of misclassification of horses here. Certainly those horses that in our databases are classified as never having had a non-fatal injury. Some of them will have had non-fatal injuries. And if we got better accuracy in terms of describing that, 
I'm sure, again, the predictive abilities in the models would uh, significantly improve. But just to give a, su a summary of that, so we've got four different um, outcome variables there, so fatal injury overall, fracture of any type, whether that be fatal or not, um, proximal sesamoid bone fracture specifically, and then cannon bone fracture. And essentially, for every extra previous EID reported injury, then the risk of each of those different outcomes increases by those percentages. So, for example, of fatal injury, for every extra EID reported previous injury, then the risk increases by 61%. So, horses that had two, then the risk would increase significantly more. Horses going on the vet list. Now, obviously, there are very many different uh, rules and regulations around the vet list in different states here, so we've had to be quite careful about how we model this. But actually, it turns out that what stays in the model uh, most significantly actually is uh, not when the horse comes off the vet list, how long the horse has been on the vet list, or how many times the horse has been on the vet list. Actually, what is important is, has the horse ever been on the vet list in its career? And actually, for, again, with those same four outcomes, um, for the top two, then there does appear to be a very significant association. So if a horse has ever been on the vet list, then its uh, risk of fatal injury uh, for the rest of its career is more than twofold. So it's 115% increased compared to a horse that's never been on the vet list. And again, uh, for the risk of fracture of any type, whether it be fatal or not, then the risk is increased by about 79%. The last two uh, are more recent models, and they include a lot more information about workout uh, and training variables. And those two actually never showed any, or not in the multivariable model when we account for all of the things, did not show any association with being on the vet list or not. And we think that's probably because the relationship between vet lists has now been superseded by actually looking at in more detail at actually the horse's time out of, tra out of training or out of work. So actually being on the vet list obviously means that the horse is... Uh, in, has an enforced layup, and actually there's probably uh, some recognition in the models that actually enforced layup comes into both of those models, which is probably partly reflecting uh, being on the vet list. Um, we, we, in, the, in the initial model we produced, then being on the vet list had a relatively simple um, relationship. Um, as I said, there's, there's no difference if you include when you come off the vet list, and the risk, importantly, does not return back to baseline. It doesn't go back to the level at which the horse was prior to being on the vet list. So we can look at this, and two horses in a national model would look something like this. A horse in, in red might go on the vet list at month, month three. Its risk would be elevated optimally, according to the uh, data-driven uh, statistical models, for approximately six months. It might come off the vet list at some point during that period, but its risk would stay elevated. And then it would come down after about six months, but it never comes back down to baseline. It stays at least 50% higher, greater risk than when it was or before it went on the vet list. Similarly, that horse, horse B that goes on the vet list twice, then it goes up, comes back down, it goes up again back to the original level. What's important is actually for the few tracks we have done individual track models for, or few states we've done individual track models for, you do see very different patterns of being on the vet list or not. And we don't necessarily think this is anything to do with what goes on in terms of the veterinary provision at those different tracks. What it's probably more likely to do with is the fact that actually you've got very different racing populations at different tracks. You've got some tracks where you have higher quality horses with lesser pathology. You've got other tracks with lower quality horses, which might have greater degrees of pathology. And actually, there are clearly other uh, factors in there that uh, relate to the regulations about whether horses go on vet lists or not. But just as an example, two tracks that we've picked out. So a horse at track A, uh, if it goes onto the vet list and it stays elevated for about six months, but its risk is about oh, sort of 2.8-fold, sort of comes back down to a baseline somewhere above 1.5-fold. One, one but at track B, a horse might go onto the vet list. It stays elevated for a shorter period of time, but actually it's much, much higher. It's, more than the, it's approaching four times greater risk of fatal injury compared to the horses uh, be, compared to before it went on the vet list. And in addition, when it comes back down again, it still is more than t twice as likely to end up with a fatal injury for the rest of its career. Then it can go back up again if it gets on the vet list again. So there are clearly very significant differences between different tracks that are really important to take count of if we're looking to be at all predictive about what individual horses are likely to be exposed to on different tracks in different parts of the country. Time with same trainer is not something that's really been investigated to any great deal in other studies that we've looked at, um, but it's really, it appears to be really important in this country, and that's probably 
related to the preponderance of horses to switch trainer more frequently after claiming races, I guess. But what we do see is that for every extra month spent with the same trainer, the risk of fatal injury or those different outcomes uh, decreases by a certain amount, by a very small amount. So fatal injury decreases by 1% fracture, proximal sesamoid bone fracture. For every extra month you spend with the same trainer, then your risk slowly decreases. For can and bone fracture, it's a pro uh, actually the estimate is about twice that, so about 2% reduction for every extra month you spend with the same trainer. If you turn that into something that is a little bit more meaningful, then actually if a, if a trainer, uh, if a horse has been with a trainer for a year, then actually the risk for that individual horse is at the end of that year is about 13% lower than when it started with that new trainer. And these are not the first trainer it's been with. This has to be a, these are, has to be horses that have switched trainers. So they've started with a different trainer and it's their new trainer, their second or third trainer they've had. For canamo fracture, then that's uh, quite a lot more significant. It's about a 27% reduction in the likelihood of uh, canamo fracture after a year with the same trainer. In addition, for the top two, uh, something else that came into the models was the first, if the horse is in that specific first start with the new trainer, then that's an elevated risk in addition. So a horse um, uh, is about 20, 28% greater risk if they're in their first start for a new trainer of fatal injury altogether, or a 9% greater risk of any type of fracture if they're in that first start for a new trainer. So what's this to do with? Well, it's likely, at least in some part, be due, due to a lack of familiarity with that individual horse, and some of that is bound to be related to the veterinary history, the history of that individual animal. So to summarize that little section, then we think there's clear evidence of the importance of previous injury, being on the vet list, or racing on for a new trainer, all of which increase the likelihood of uh, fatal injury. Um, a knowledge of health records will undoubtedly improve the uh, models and the predictive ability and therefore the usefulness of the models. So talking about predictive ability, and uh, I've shown this slide before, and um, we're kind of stuck at this sort of 65% level where we, we, we build the models and we assess the predictive ability of them. And we do this by uh, drawing these uh, plots area under the curve of, of the rock curve. Uh, we don't really need to worry about exactly what this means, but actually in, in kind of trying to translate this is, is a little bit of a difficult concept to uh, understand. But the, the best way of trying to understand it is that um, if you selected two horses at random from a particular race, one of which with your future scope you knew was going to end up with a fatal injury or, or, or a different type of injury, you would correct, the models would correctly identify the one that was going to end up with a fatal injury 65% of the time. Now, that's not particularly useful at the moment. If that was a, a diagnostic test in a medical lab, there's no way you'd accept that as being of any use. It is better than a coin toss, but at the moment it's not useful enough to use on the track, and we admit that uh, there's still a good deal of work to do to improve that particular predictive ability. There is variable predictive ability at different tracks, so if we look at that, then they range from 53%, which is genuinely not much better than a coin toss, to 68%. Most track, individual track models, which we did about three or four years ago now, maybe two or three years ago, are slightly less predictive. That's probably likely due to a lack of statistical power or reduced statistical power. I think if we re-ran re some of those, then I think that would improve. But there are bound to be a lot of local factors that are simply missed by the EID and just not recorded at all. And if we could get our hands on those, then I'm sure that, again, those individual track models would improve. The importance of that local model and working with those on the ground at different tracks is really, really important. And we're definitely in the case in that situation now where there are definitely a case to be made where we can build track and state-specific models that will certainly improve our models and uh, help uh, you guys on the ground when you're trying to make difficult decisions about whether horses should race or not. I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, and highlight the difficulty we have about why it's so difficult to be more predictive. Um, there are two main issues that we face. One, one is the frequency of the outcome we're trying to model, and the second is the scope of the data. And I should just reiterate, you know, the amount of data is not an issue. This is by far and away the biggest database that anyone in any uh, racing jurisdiction is having to deal with in terms of building models. There's statistical power is, is really not an issue. The two, the two key things are the frequency of the outcome and the, the, scope, of the, the scope of the data. And I just want to talk a little bit about each of those. So if we think about the frequency of the outcome, if the risk is approximately 0.18%, in 10,000 starts, you might see 18 fatal injuries, 
9,982 starts not ending in fatal injury? If you had to guess, you're always going to guess no, because you're going to be, nine, you're going to be correct 99.82% of the time. So what we're trying to do is actually the models work in very much similar way. They're trying to improve upon something that already, already is a very good null model uh, and trying to get somewhere away from those routine guessing of no. So how do we make it a little bit easier for ourselves? Well, we, the, what we've been thinking about over the last few years was essentially increasing the frequency of the outcome that we decide to model. And the main approaches we've used there are talking about whether we should model lifetime risk, season risk, or meat risk when a, a bunch of horses turn up at a particular track. We want to know which of those horses are not going to leave that track at the end of the meet. But again, that comes down to the same similar problem in that actually it doesn't really help the racing regulatory vet on the ground when they're having to make a decision about whether to enter or whether the owners or trainers are making a decision about whether to enter a horse into a particular race or whether the regulatory vet's having to make decisions about whether to allow a horse to continue and, uh, behind the start gate on, and that sort of thing. So the other way we're approaching this now is actually to model injury rather than fatal injury, and this sort of comes back to the original uh, premise of this talk. And we've got a lot of work going on in other racing jurisdictions where we're looking at modeling um, unacceptable performance or post-race lameness as a precursor uh, uh, to understand the risk factors for those, knowing that we've just seen a lot of evidence to say, actually, those horses that do end up with those less serious outcomes are a significantly greater risk of ending up with fatal injury anyway. So let's take it back a step. Let's understand the risk factors for those pre-fatal injuries. And actually, if you can start preventing those, then you're bound to consequently prevent fatal injury on top as well. The second um, impediment to improving the predictive ability of the model is, is, uh, relates to the scope of the data. And many of you who are uh, here two years ago will have, will have seen this, um, uh, this uh, a similar version of this slide, where we looked at what contributed to the significant drop uh, in the risk of fatal injury in 2016. And we looked at the prevalence of different risk factors we knew were associated with the outcome. And we identified that these were six of the main risk factors that certainly contributed quite a lot to that significant drop. Age at first start appearing to be one of the more significant ones, surface condition, race intensity, etc. But if you lump all those together, they explain about 35% of the drop in the risk of fatal injury that we saw in 2016. That means there's quite a lot still un, as yet unexplained. And we hypothesized that they could be related to lots of these different things here. And out on top came veterinary history. And we've kind of expanded this analysis a little just in the few recent days and uh, on the plane on the way over here to look at, look at this. And this takes a little bit of understanding, but essentially there's a way in the models we produce to understand where the variability in the outcome or the variance in the outcome still lies, whether it lies at the level of the horse, which might be its age, its gender, risk factors associated with the horse, whether it lies at the level of the race, the trainer, the race course, genetics, jockey, or elsewhere. First thing you'll notice is still the biggest percentage um, in this pie chart um, is the 27%, which is the unexplained variability that really we can't ascribe to any of those other different areas at the moment. And that, that could just simply be down to random variation or it's something we just have not yet to conceptualize and think about. But the next biggest group is this uh, in the top right corner where we're talking about horse. And um, I split that into two sections, which is explained. So these are factors that we know already that are related to the horse, how much of the variance in the outcome they already contribute. And then there's 18% that is still as yet unexplained. So there's 18% of the outcome, the variance in the outcome that is, still, that is related to the horse that is still as yet unexplained. And that is unexplained because we don't have the data to contribute to the explanation for that particular uh, factor. We then just recently, in the last month or so, in discussions with the Jockey Club, uh, started looking at, uh, in more detail, about the EID non-fatal injuries that we do have recorded. And we've sort of split this into a flow diagram to understand what happens to those individual animals. And of more than 3.1 million race starts, 12,500 of those ended in a first occurrence non-fatal injury. So that's a, that's a rate of about 0.4%. Of those, 54% never appeared in the EID race records again. So 6,730 did not appear on the racetrack again, and we don't really quite know where they went. So they, but they definitely didn't appear on the racetrack and, and partake in another race again. 46% made at least one further start. So that's really the interesting group as far as we're concerned in terms of what we can do about those, what we can identify what happened to those individual animals. 
So if we take them, and actually just to look at a little, a little bit of economics about it, so we, we compared the three races prior to injury, uh, the average purse and the three races post-injury, and the average purse for those horses post-injury dropped by about 20%. Prior to injury, it was about $30,000. Post-injury, the purse, the average purse for the races they were entering was about $24,000. The vast, vast majority, as you might expect, of those horses, 97%, obviously didn't end up with a fatal injury, having followed a non-fatal injury. But 892 of those horses, or 16%, did end up with at least one further non-fatal injury. Some horses had as many, I think it was one horse that had four or five non-fatal injuries in, recorded in the EID database. The vast majority of those 892, 750 odd, had one further non-fatal injury. Obviously that leaves 3% of horses, 177, actually sustained a fatal injury following their non-fatal injury at some point during their career. And that 3% is significantly greater than the, as you might imagine, the average national baseline for uh, the risk of fatal injury. If you look at that, there's about 70% greater risk for a horse that's had a non-fatal injury of sustaining a fatal injury. Uh, at 3.1 per thousand starts compared to about 1.8 per thousand starts. If we look a little bit more detail at those 177 horses that did sustain a fatal injury during racing, then their months until fatal injury looks something like this. So 54%, 95 out of 177, uh, had sustained their fatal injury following their non-fatal injury within about uh, within 12 months. And that equates to, of all those that sustained a, a non-fatal injury, 1.6% of those were dead within 12 months from a racetrack fatal injury. So the final aspect of this is to recognizing that there's quite a lot of uh, difficulty in ensuring that we have a full, complete census of non-fatal injuries in, within the EID. We wanted to work out some way of actually trying to identify uh, which tracks were reporting well, which tracks were reporting badly, which tracks were reporting well in some years but less well in other years and that sort of thing. So what we did, we looked at the ratio of non-fatal to fatal injuries on this premise that essentially there shouldn't be, there will be some variation, but there shouldn't there's no real um, justification or, or understanding as to why there should be any great deal of variation between different tracks in different parts of the country. So if we look at this, this is an example uh, of one of these plots. Um, and what I want to show you is the gray bars, uh, this is a rather small axis here, but it goes from zero to 60. Uh, the gray bars are the hundreds of starts on this anonymized track uh, in 2009 to 2017. The red line is the number on this axis of fatal injuries, and the green line is the number of non-fatal injuries. So we would look at this and say, okay, apart from the first few years when everything was bedding down, then the ratio of fatal to non-fatal injuries looks to be reasonably constant, so we'd say that's probably a reasonably well-reported track. They seem to be doing things reasonably well and it seems to be working. Similarly, with these two tracks, they look different patterns, but again, we wouldn't really suggest that very much is going wrong with those individual tracks. They seem to be reporting well. You might say that this one here, something might be, going, might be going awry, or they might just be doing a good job about addressing their non-fatal injuries. If you compare those to these three tracks, so you can see there's significant fluctuations in years where the, the, the ratio of non-fatal to fatal injury is significantly lower compared to previously. Certainly on this track, it's dropped off totally, uh, and this track's all over the place, up and down. And this could obviously be due to different personnel coming onto the track, could be different, different motivations of the track, other things being put on those individuals who are responsible for reporting uh, non-fatal injuries. They're having other jobs to do, and actually this becomes less important. But if we look in general, sorry, if we look overall, then the ratio of non-fatal to fatal injuries on the national scale is about 2.2 to 1. It's interesting to see at some tracks, then for some years it was as much as 7 to 1, but it has been, and, and it can be as low as 1.5 to 1, at the same track in the different years. So it can fluctuate quite significantly. And indeed, some tracks are consistently lower uh, and closer to one to one uh, compared to the national average. So there's certainly some tracks are reporting well, others less well. So to summarize overall, I think we've seen there's clearly evidence for the importance of non-fatal injuries. We've seen the risk factors that all relate to non-fatal injuries. Um, We've seen what are we missing. We've looked at the percentage of unexplained variants related to the horse being really important. 
We've looked at the impact of non-fatal injuries on future career with 50%, more than 50% never racing again, and certainly an elevated risk of non-fatal or fatal injury for those individual horses who do end up with a, a non-fatal injury on the racetrack. Certainly, if we could get a more accurate indicator of horses with previous injury, it would very much likely make a significant difference to the uh, predictive ability of our model. So how do we encourage better reporting? Given that there are about 12,000 starts, uh, 12, 000, uh, starts that ended in non-fatal injury in the database so far, it's likely there are thousands of non-fatal injuries that go unreported. And certainly, if you think about that, we're just talking about racing, racing non-fatal injuries. If we were able to re record those that occurred in training as well, that's definitely in the thousands. It's not clear that in reporting is improving across all tracks, and certainly in some tracks it's less good in the, in some, in the recent years. And as I said, equally and probably more importantly is that we need to get a handle on uh, the reporting of non-fatal injuries in training as well as in racing. Most previous studies suggest that there are at least as many injuries and fatalities in training as there are on the racetrack. So how do we better encourage reporting? And this is my final slide, really, just the challenge. And um, I'm not suggesting I've got any answers here, but I'm just putting out a set of questions, really. Who should be responsible for ensuring the reporting? How can we incentivize that reporting? How can we make those that are responsible for it understand that it is a critical part of what should be going into EID? How do we ensure accurate reporting and the consistency of reporting, as we've seen, is really, really important. It's got to be consistent across different tracks, and it's got to be consistent within the same track by different people who may come onto that track. And I'd really encourage the sharing of good practice amongst those who know they do it well uh, to make it easier for those who maybe currently find it difficult to do for other reasons, for whatever those reasons might be. So with that, I'd just like to make my acknowledgments, and uh, I'll see if there are any questions. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. All right, so we do have quite a few questions, actually. Um, first off was, on the tracks that don't participate, can you quantify the improvement in the data towards the goal of reducing fatalities if more or all tracks participated? Um, I could if I knew how many injuries are missing, I guess. <laughs> which, would, which is a kind of a, it's a, that's a bit of a catch-22 question, isn't it, I guess? I, I would estimate that we're probably... I don't know, and this is a pure guess. We're probably, probably missing at least 50% of non-fatal injuries. That's probably just those in the racing EID. Mm -hmm. If we included training, then it would be significantly more than that. I, I think probably what we're dealing with, we're probably, of those non-fatal injuries of which we have a handle, that's probably in the 25 to 30% of all non-fatal injuries on the track. But there are probably others in the, in the room who'd be better able to answer that than me. Okay. Um, Dr. Henchins had mentioned the level of experience or accomplishment of the horse as a risk factor for the jockey injury. Has, there, or has the converse, the experience of the jockey, been evaluated as it relates to racehorse injury? Uh, it has, and we put that into every model that we uh, put in. Um, it does come up as being significant in some models. Certainly in the UK, when we're dealing with jump racing, that it appears to be a much more significant factor than in flat racing. You know? And certainly we see apprentice jockeys or... Uh, less experienced jockeys presenting a greater risk uh, in jump racing than we do uh, the more uh, proficient or experienced jockeys. But we tend not to see it in any of the models we produce for the, in North America at the moment. Okay. Um, and kind of following a little with that is, um, have you seen or do you believe that a jockey injury or impairment um, could have an effect on the risk factor for the injury of the horse? Um, uh, again, I'd be, I'd be totally guessing, but I would have, I, it would make perfect sense that that would be the case. I, I think it, it, everything we've talked about this morning, you know, the previous panel clearly shows how important that is, and actually it's, it's bound to be the case that any sort of jockey impairment, their judgment-making and that sort of thing is bound to, bound to have an influence on that, I would have thought, yeah. Okay. Um, at this point, can you discern whether there are significantly different injury profiles between training and racing injuries? At the moment, no. Um, yeah. We're not in a position really to be able to say anything firm about training injuries compared to racing injuries. I think that's, you know, it, there's an awful lot of work, as you know, that goes on before any data comes to me in terms of quality assurance and that sort of thing. And it's just so difficult to do that with the training injuries at the moment. Um, we, we, we need to get to that stage. And, you know, in three, four years' time, once we've started this process, and I'm sure we'll be there. Great. Um, what is the cumulative increase in risk 
of a fatal musculoskeletal injury if all three risk factors indicated earlier are present, an injury in the EID, been on a vets list, and the new trainer first race? Um, I'll have to come back to you on that, I'm afraid. I, my maths is not that good. <laughs> that was a, that's a tough question. I'll, I'll come and get the name of that person in a minute. Okay. I'll, I'll give you that one. Um, then this is related to the surfaces. Um, the question came in um, specifically regarding synthetic surfaces. Um, we see that there's an, uh, the fatality has been lowered, um, but are you seeing more soft tissue injuries or more... Um, non-fatals on the synthetics. Again, you know, anecdotal reports certainly from people like uh, Dr. Arthur and that sort of thing would suggest that, you know, the, the pattern of injuries is, is different on synthetic compared to dirt and that sort of thing. Um, again, it comes to the same issue. We don't really have particularly sufficient certainty in the records that we have at the moment for the different surfaces for the non-fatals to be sure to, to uh, make any firm statements about that, really. Okay. Um, and last one, given the twofold risk of fatal injury for horses which have ever been on a vet's list, is there data to suggest things that tracks or veterinarians can do to mitigate the risk to those horses? I guess, you know, speaking with a lot of um, racetrack vets, you know, what everyone always look, what they always all look at is they look for things in their own jurisdiction that will increase the risk for individual horses. And just being aware that, Everyone probably knew that being on the vet list increases the risk, but what's actually important is it's, we quantify by how much that risk is elevated. So I think it's really important to understand of all the parameters that might or might not increase the risk, which of those are really important so that individual regulatory vets can focus just on those individual uh, risk factors that are most likely to result in an elevated risk for individual animals. So I think most of the people I talk to about this, they all know if a horse has been on their vet list, it's going to be an elevated risk anyway. And, you know, it's one of those key things they keep at the back of their mind when they're assessing a horse. Okay, this horse has been on the vet list. Let's look at it now. And actually, they, they, they make those uh, judgments as they go along. Okay. And there's actually one more came in. Um, what are the parameters of a non-fatal injury or what is a non-fatal defined as in the EID? A non-fatal injury? Yeah. Uh, a horse that doesn't end up dead. Okay. So anything, <laughs> anything in the yeah, But yeah, has yeah. an injury. Right. So, yeah. So, actually, actually good, no, there is a good question, actually. So, it, it, essentially, it is broken down into different triage levels. So, triage one to four. And, actually, what we take is, uh, I think we took, uh, for each of those different triage levels, then there's a comment box which the vets fill in. And we text mine those box to identify individual horses that end up with different types of injuries. So obviously we exclude the fatal ones and then we look for all the comments that relate to non-fatal injuries uh, in those comments box, whether they be triage one, two, three or four. Right. Okay. Great. I think that's all we have. Okay.